Hello everyone, welcome to Liam's Lyceum, I'm your host Liam, aka Hemvar, and today I wanted to talk about some books that influenced Tolkien. Now, I've probably mentioned all of this before in previous videos, but for those who either aren't subscribed or don't want to search through my hundreds of videos, uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, specifically books that influenced Tolkien, not just books he read, or books, you know, that we know he read, I'm sure we couldn't even figure all that out, but I'm sure there's someone out there who's probably written a book or made a website or something about what we know Tolkien read, and now we do know some of it, and I know some of the stuff that he read, so I'm going to talk about those, but just ones I largely feel like are worth mentioning. I'm going to go over just a few of them very shortly, but again, like I said, it's not just stuff that we know he read. For example, um, we know he read Hell's Guard by C.L. Moore, which is a Jarell of Juari story, and he described it as eerie, incredible, and also good. So, um, but that influence his writing. I just think it's cool because I like Jarell of Juari. But <clears throat> the, the first big one that if you wanted to get an idea for Tolkien um, is Beowulf, which is an old English poem. Um, and by old English, I don't mean Shakespeare. I mean old English, so like early medieval um, English. Uh, it starts as And those are the first lines of Beowulf in English, but not our modern English, obviously. So, um, But this is a tale that you can see influences writing, largely just because he's a huge scholar of it. He's a very important scholar of Beowulf. Um, but uh, you see something as simple as, for example, at the end of Beowulf, he faces three monsters in the story. He faces Grendel, Grendel's mother, and a dragon. And when he's facing the dragon, uh, some thief had gone into the dragon's uh, like hoard of treasure and taken out a cup. And this is, uh, well, you can see this influence when you read The Hobbit and Bilbo. What does he take? He takes a cup, and he's a thief going in this dragon's den, right? Uh, so that's a big one. Another big one, of course, is something that uh, a, a lot of people, maybe even a lot, sometimes people tend to ignore um, important things uh, like religion, I, I feel like, for an author. And uh, the Bible is very influential on Tolkien. I would say specifically the Vulgate. Uh, he learned Latin very young uh, when the Catholic Church, because he was Catholic, um, got rid of the liturgy in Latin. He supposedly, according to his grandson, like sat in, you know, or, well, I, he apparently was shouting the Latin while they were reading the English. So, um, <laughs> so he was very much influenced by the Bible. When you read his works, they don't come off as overly Christian. Uh, they're very much not preachy. Uh, he has very much this uh, pagan spirit in his stories. And this kind of goes back to Beowulf, right? Where Beowulf itself it is actually more obviously Christian than say like the Lord of the Rings is. Um, but you can tell a story was, is about pagans, right? That's the idea. So uh, it's the same thing with Lord of the Rings. The story is about pagans. But do they fit? Are they intuitive pagans? Are they? Would they accept Jesus if they had the chance? Yeah, they would. And Lord of the Rings, that's kind of the idea, at least. So, um, And it does fit. It fits with Christianity. It just doesn't really mention it much either. So anyways, the third one is the Kale... Kalevala, Kalevala, I'm not really sure how to say it, but it's uh, the story of Kulervo, if you want to read Tolkien's version of it. Um, and Kulervo is a character who is very much the inspiration for Turin Turambar, uh, who is my, maybe my favorite Tolkien character. He's awesome. Um, and he is uh, a character you can find in a chapter in Silmarillion, but he is the star of the Children of Huron novel, uh, which was published um, in 2007, I believe. Um, and the story of Kulervo, though, itself, it is the Finnish national epic. Uh, it's a pretty recent for a national epic. Um, I believe it's a compilation of things uh, that whoever the guy was, I can't remember his name, um, kind of took from folklore, essentially, is the idea. So very much around that time of nationalism and romanticism, though, but still very much an influence as well on Tolkien. And now getting into stuff that is maybe... I don't know, different, I guess. Uh, actually, there's another one in here later, but still. Uh, we have William Morris. William Morris is a big influence on Tolkien. I don't have any of his books out with me because they are all antiques, and so I keep them in a special place so they don't get damaged. Um, but <clears throat> William Morris, specifically, 
He wrote these prose romances, which are essentially early fantasy novels. He called them prose romances. Uh, and he wanted to imitate the medieval style of romance. And guess what? Tolkien wanted to imitate William Morris when he was writing. Uh, and so William Morris gets a lot of credit, okay? William Morris is like, if you want to read like an author, I guess if you wanted to read a author who's writing something that is, yeah, you can say is fantasy um, because you like reading fantasy books or whatever, I would read William Morris. He uses archaic language. Uh, he has um, very much a sense of the poetic uh, but he also has some things that are like very obviously influences. For example, um, in his first prose romance, House of the Wolfings, the story takes place in Mirkwood. Now, this isn't the first person to use Mirkwood, but it's likely where Tolkien got it from, um, or at least where maybe he directly got it from, because he likely got it from a couple places. But And also we have uh, William Morris and his, um, he's got a relationship in The Roots of the Mountains, which this seems similar to the Arwen Eowyn Aragorn relationship. And the, the phrase, the roots of the mountains itself is taken from that. You know, Tolkien would use that phrase. Uh, the story of the Glittering Plain personally reminds me of some of the Undying Lands or Valinor. And there's a character in The Wood Beyond the World that also reminds me a little bit of Gollum as well. So, um, yeah, take that as you will. There, there, There's lots of stuff in William Morris if you just go and read them. <clears throat> Another big one is She by H. Ryder Haggard. And uh, Haggard is a contemporary with Morris, if I'm remembering correctly. They're both from the late 19th century. And she is a novel that it actually has several sequels. And Haggard wrote a lot of stuff. And he's mostly famous for his Lost World novels. And she is one of those, actually. And it is about uh, a woman named Aisha. Or Aisha, or Aisha, I'm not really quite sure. But uh, she's an ancient woman uh, who has a magic... Um, I can't remember exactly, actually. It might just be like a well, or it might just... She sees through water magically, essentially. Now, you might understand who this is. It's Galadriel, essentially. This is the influence for Galadriel and her um, mirror, or the mirror of Galadriel, right? Uh, and so Tolkien really liked the story. Apparently, he read it quite a bit as a boy. Uh, if you read his early poem, Cor in a City Lost and Dead, I believe is what it's called, that is about... Core, which is the city and she so uh, and she is a good i is a novel i very much enjoyed it's dated in obvious ways i feel like but uh i very much enjoy the story but still another one that would be good to look at uh maybe uh is, is a little different and pretty simple kind of more in line along the lines of the earlier ones i mentioned but even then would be a the poetic edda um, or the Veluspa, or specifically the dwergatal or vergatal depending on which version will more just be here but um uh, and that is um where Tolkien gets his basically all his dwarf names actually Dwergatal Dwerg is dwarf essentially right so um he's getting all his dwarf names from there especially particularly the ones from the Hobbit you can go in there and you'll read Oakenshield and um Ori Nori Dori stuff like that so and then another one is uh Fantasties and the Princess and the Goblin by George MacDonald. Um, I know Fantasies is probably more of a in, big influence on uh, C.S. Lewis, but it is an influence still on um, Tolkien. Um, Princess and Goblin is more of a kid's novel. You can see that. Uh, but then Fantasies also has some beings that are kind of like Ints that might have uh, either consciously or subconsciously influenced influenced his Ints, which I believe would come later after he read Fantasies. Fantasies came out. 1850s, if I remember correctly. So, and that is considered the first adult fantasy novel. Oh, and uh, generally considered the first adult fantasy novel. Generally, as far as I'm aware, the first uh, fantasy novel that has a secondary world is William Morris's The Story of the Glittering Plain, though. I'll just go back and mention that real quick. And then the last two I'll mention real quick that you might want to check out. Um, these are uh, a little bit more particular. Uh, maybe if you like reading medieval things, Beowulf is just cool, I think, and you should read it anyways. If you speak English, you should just read Beowulf. Um, but another one is an old English poem, Christ, uh, which has um, a line in it that would very much influence uh, Tolkien. And it's a rather famous line, if you're familiar with Tolkien, but maybe not, if you're not familiar with Tolkien, that is, 
Ella erendel ingla bertast over midanier monum sindid, um, which is hail erendel, or erendel, brightest of angels sent over middle earth to men. Midanier, it is middle earth. It's similar. It's related to Midgard, if you've heard that term for from Marvel or something. Um, so, uh, yeah, and Erendil is a is a Arvin, Arvindil, Arvindil, if you know the old Norse stuff. Um, likely is just like Venus, the morning star or whatever, but it influenced uh, his writing um, and where we get the, the Mariner, of course, of Tolkien fame, obviously. So another one is a later poem. So not Old English, but in Middle English, actually, you have the King Horn Romance, uh, 13th century. And uh, there's these four lines, actually. Um, it says, He met in with Armar King, Christ Jeven him his blessing, King of Western Nessa, Christ Jeven him mutual blisse. Uh, and uh, that third line, King of Western Nessa, so King of Westerness. Uh, Westerness being, of course, another title Tolkien uses uh, for um, Numenor in his stuff. And of course, there's other influences there. You get a glimpse of that, right? Numenor, that's very much Atlantean. A lot of mythos stuff is going to get into his stuff. He liked the Celtic stuff. He liked whatever, right? So I mean, like he liked a lot. And I'm not going to go over all of it, of course. I mean, there's Shakespeare influence. Uh, there's his reading of uh, American Indian uh, novels, uh, stuff like that when he was a kid. So, but uh those are the ones that came to mind, at least, so I thought maybe some of you would find that useful if you haven't read any of that stuff, or if you have read it, and maybe you were interested in checking out some of the other stuff. I'll try to list the ones that I mentioned down below, so uh, that you can have a, a good idea if you, since I didn't hold anything up, right? But anyways, leave from Liam's Lyceum. I will catch you next time.